You're listening to the Audacious Church Podcast. We know this is a great investment into your life. So tune in, listen up, and stay focused. For any more information, visit us online, audaciouschurch.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another Audacious Leadership Podcast. This is us all the way from sunny Manchester. (laughs) Absolutely. Sunny Manchester, we're so glad you have chosen to take some time out to talk to us, talk with us about leadership and about audacious leadership. And really, this episode is going to do just that. We kind of going to go back to our roots. Yes. We're going to remind, I would even say awaken. Awaken. Well, we've been loving um, the Grit series that we've been doing. And uh, I know that I personally have a few more hairs on my chest because of the Grit series. Um, we, uh, we know that as audacious leaders, there are yes. certain things that would be um, not unique to us, but definitely are part of who we are. Absolutely. And um, God has been reminding us about those things over the last few months. We've talked about being fearlessly devoted. We've talked about, um, you know, having serious fun. We've talked about... Wildly authentic. Yeah, being authentic. But there was one really that we want to focus on in this episode that was kind of bubbling under the surface while God was reminding us of these things. And it can really be summarized in one word, which is what the series has been, which is, drum roll. Grit. Grit. Grit, which basically represents this attitude. And it's the best word we could come up with that basically says this. We will do... Whatever, whatever it, it takes. And if you've been around Audacious for um, any length of time, you will have seen this in, in practice. You would have seen this worked out um, by the, the people of Audacious. Absolutely. And we've got the stories um, that we can back up with that. But before we get into uh, maybe all of those, uh, we can maybe think of those stories. We're going to just remind you of the scripture um, that came out of the Grit series, and that is Luke 9, verse 23 to 25. And it says this in the NIV, Then He said to them all, Jesus speaking, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Absolutely. And I've been involved in some kind of leadership for over 20 years. And that would definitely be something that has just come round again and again of just recognising the call of God is it takes everything I have. Absolutely. We, we often talk about youth camp. Yeah. It's the youth camp final night where everybody is on their knees at the front, snot fest, you know, (laughs) bawling their eyes out saying, yes, I'm going to lay my life down for the cause of Christ. I'm going to give everything that I've got for Jesus. So at youth camp, we're having this moment, we're making this decision, but we know that we need to have um, those moments on a regular basis. Yeah. Because this is who we are. This is not just um, a radical form of Christianity. This is actually Christianity 101. This <laughs> it is, is the, Christianity. This is the basic level of Christianity that is that we lay down our life, we take up our cross and we follow Jesus. So the, the thing that wars against this, uh, this characteristic as, in us as a people is the fact that we're in a convenience culture. Yeah. I don't know if our forefathers, the ones that, you know, are listed in the Bible and the ones that, you know, are heroes of the faith yeah, in church Hebrews history. 11, that gallery of, yeah, of like breakthrough people. They didn't have Facebook and they didn't have, you know, um, a lot of a lot of things that, that we have now. I'm sure they had their version of, um, you know, things that could take them away from the per- the plans and the purposes of God or somehow dilute their passion for Jesus. But what we have today is a whole culture that is geared around making life easier. And it's fine when it's 
you know, creating opportunities us for perhaps to do more or to be more efficient or more effective. Yeah, the phrase you used in in one message was um, convenience is great. Convenience culture is good if it's a means to an end, but if it is the end, yeah, as in like the goal is convenience, yeah. then it, we're we're in danger of of taking. What I'm about to say sounds like, how can you do that? But we take the power of God out of our leadership, out of the call of God. It kind of makes it a hollow version of what we know to be true of the call of God for our lives. I think it's um, it's scary to think that this culture of convenience can be so subtle in our lives that it can water us down water us down in terms of our passion for Jesus, our identity in Him, and um, and what our plan or what God's plan for us is or our purpose on the planet, you know, to partner with Him in bringing His kingdom uh, to earth so that other people can know about His love and salvation. So um, I think we've recognised that we've got a moment here in terms of our us as audacious leaders that we want to self-evaluate. We want yeah. to just think, okay, what? Where are we? You know, it's like that boat that goes into, you know, goes on a particular course in the ocean, but doesn't realise that its equipment is one degree out. And it's almost like sometimes with our convenience culture and just, you know, celebrating ease, celebrating, you know. Comfort, celebrating, um, you know, convenience. Convenience. Um, it's like that one degree off. We're not bad people. We love God. We want to do what He has called us to do. But in the course, we kind of like go go so far away from where we originally were that we can one day wake up and go, "How how did I get here? This yeah. is not who I am. This is not." where I started. This is not the intention that I had for my life. Um, and we start saying crazy things like, so um, what's the minimum requirement Yeah, for living for Jesus? Yeah. Or just, you know, the language of too hard, too inconvenient, too difficult. And it's things that, um, you know, if you said that to your if you said that to your past self at youth camp, for example, or, at or time, when you gave your life yeah, to God, like, exactly. And you say like, oh, you know, in the future, you're going to be saying, you know, do I really need to go to church every week? And, you know, past you would slap future you and say, are you joking? I'll do anything for Jesus type thing. And we, we have the, essentially what we're asking is for you to consider has convenience culture crept up on you and your leadership in any way? Because it's cleverly marketed um, to feel like a, even like a celebration of, of expression and individuality. Yeah, so you could be saying, well, you know, I've got my Facebook page, I've got my Instagram account, you know, I've got my live stories that I'm doing. and I've got yeah. my playlist. Yeah. <laughs> I've got my, you know, uh, my list. Everything's got a list, all of these um, platforms yeah. have a list and it's bespoke to you and it's like, oh, isn't this awesome? Um, and we kind of feel like it's bespoke and therefore it's celebrating our individualism yeah. and our expression. But question for us to consider is, is it in actual fact, in some ways, killing it? Because I, I saw something recently. I was in traffic and saw a school bus drive past. Now, 20 years ago, no longer than that. When I was at school a long time ago, the school bus was like a hive of activity and you had all the different like... You know what it's like at, at secondary school, you've got all the different subgroups and the skaters and the, you know, and the, the sporty people and all the rest of it. The it emos. Was, yeah, and they're, all, and, and they're all represented on the bus and they've all got their own areas and they're all kind of interacting with each other and shouting and climbing over seats. And the school bus was like a jungle, you know what I mean? It was like crazy on the school bus. I, dr I drove past a school bus in traffic recently and everybody was sat in their seat. And you might say, especially if you're a bus driver, this is a great thing, but everyone was sat in their seat, eyes down, looking at their device. Oh. So therefore, you know, with their individual playlist and their individual, you know, game that they're up to, they, they all look the same. Wow. So in a way, we may be thinking we're celebrating our individuality, but we're losing something. And I want to... Um, just pause here and just ask the question, 
are you like that boat that maybe has deviated away from the true course or the original course that you, that you had when you first gave your life to Jesus? Has convenience crept in and just watered you down a little bit or um, caused you to question what, what God is actually asking of you? You see, at the beginning, we would never uh, entertain the thought that perhaps we would not obey God or not do what he's asking us to do, or rationalise his request down to the level where we think, oh, yeah, that's okay, I can do that. That's not a massive cost to me. Um, And we're actually rationalising away our true identity as followers of Jesus. Absolutely. Uh, Saying things that, in reality, you would never have said. Yeah. Doing things, going places, thinking things that you would just never have said and are done or gone. Um, and it's sobering. We understand that. So good on you for, you know, keeping this rolling. Don't, don't pause and bail just yet. Because what we want to move on to talk about is like, what can we do? Like, we have to snap out of it. We have to wake up the sleeping giant. We have to um, come back to our first love to, you know, to go Bible-based. I think um, I'd like, we'd like to see this as a little bit like the canary, the canary in the mine. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Because we know that convenience is so subtle and sometimes you'd be thinking, no, there's nothing wrong with me. You know, I've been the same, I'm the same person I, I was when I first started this journey with the Lord. But what we're trying to create is a little bit of an alert, a little yep. bit of an alarm that says, hang on, let's just take a moment just to ask the question, where are we? Um, has convenience watered, watered us down? Because if it has, then we are not really expressing our true identity as followers of Jesus. And I believe, and I think um, we as a church believe, that God is wanting to do something incredible in our midst. Yes. He's wanting to move in, in ways that we haven't seen Him move before. He wants to do the unprecedented. He wants to move in people's lives. There are people who don't know him yet, um, but will because of our lives and the way we're living and following Jesus. So it's almost like uh, we're on the precipice of something incredible. So let's just take it a moment just to make sure that we're all doing good. Jesus talks uh, to a particular church in the book of Revelation, um, the church of Laodicea, and he says... In chapter 14, is that right? It's chapter 3, Chapter verse 3, 14. verse 14, where he says, you know, you guys look like you've got it all together, me paraphrasing. You look Ooh, like you've SBV. got... Ooh, um, You know, you look rich. You look like you've got blessing that you've got all the bells and whistles. People must look at you and think you, you guys have got it going on. He said, but you're neither... Hot nor cold. He said, I would actually rather you were either hot or cold, but instead you're lukewarm. And he says those immortal words that, you know, I'm about to spew you out of my mouth. I remember reading that um, as a young Christian and thinking, I never want to be that. I never want to be lukewarm. I never want to compromise my um, my passion for Jesus. Um but I feel challenged, even myself, that that we can get caught in our routines. We can be caught in in how we do church and all the responsibilities. And we've got to be here, and we've got to do this service, and we've got to do that meeting, and we've got to, you know, uh, fulfill our responsibilities. That we don't realize that our passions waned. So we have to do something, um, because. And so we're going to get practical to finish, but we have to do something because we know that transformation, effective leadership happens with hot leaders. Hot leaders. Not lukewarm ones, you know. Can I get a witness? (laughs) Audacious leaders, hot leaders. If you're a hot leader, give me a holler. (laughs) Um, But we know that, you know, what is the point of doing stuff if it's not effective? Like we may as well be spat out. We may as well not bother. We may as well just go, let's not do it. Um, which is the verse that I think we've talked about on this podcast before about the dull acts. Ecclesiastes 10 verse 10 says, 
if the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, then more strength is needed. So it's harder work, but skill will bring success. And so what we don't want you to hear when we go practical now is you just got to do more because the last podcast, we talked about the hare and the tortoise and we can be like the hare in response to this going, okay, I just got to... Got to sort my life out get up earlier and go to bed later and just do more but that verse in Ecclesiastes is saying um, and even the moral of the hare and the tortoise is not doing more it's about um, being smarter and the, to use the word sharp to go with the axe it's actually if you take the time to sharpen and we've done spiritual disciplines in this podcast um, so we're going to maybe just have a look at, at what we did um, more recently, um, as a bit of a practical way to finish, just a couple of things that we either are doing or can do to be able to make sure that we're alert, we're awake, we're sharp, we're hot, whatever word you want to use, but the call of God is not reduced to a convenient yet powerless um, shadow of what it should be, because that's not who we are. That's not who we are. We're a people of whatever it takes. Absolutely. Which is why we're talking about it in the first place. So one of the ways that we do that is through prayer and fasting. So getting rid of some of the the luxuries of life or the things that, that we rely on and just so that we can prioritise our relationship. The Bible also talks about going back to our first love. So prioritising our relationship with God and just reminding ourselves of our first love, you know, that moment when we laid down our lives and said, yes, Lord, not my will, but your will be done. Um, That's always a great moment. That's always a great reminder and a great thing to do. Yeah, as a whole church, we uh, have recently, or we're right now, as we're talking now, we're in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting. And it's great to be able to bring some focus. But how about we just um, make that a discipline, again, spiritual disciplines in our own lives? Because I think we're having this conversation because we're in the middle of 21 days of prayer and fasting. It's like brought something out that perhaps we wouldn't have seen because we were duller in our in our sensitivity to the Holy Spirit and what God is saying. Now we're in this prayer and fasting. It's sharpening us and we're going, hey, we need to wake up. So as a principle, we can do this. We can go without something or, or, or make some some tough discipline decisions to be able to stay sharp. Absolutely. Um, even just changing one thing in your routine, just one tweak, either setting the alarm clock 10 minutes earlier so that you can get up and just have that time where you can maybe ramp up one of your spiritual disciplines that we talked about last year or in our previous podcast and just ramp it up a little bit. Yeah. Just turn turn up the heat um, in our prayer or in our praise or in speaking in our heavenly language, whatever it may be, just ramping it up at this time. Yeah, and one thing that the sort of church-wide 21 days of prayer and fasting has done is shown me the power of the second thing that I would suggest is actually the, um, the power of togetherness, as in we actually can sharpen each other. Yeah. Just to be able to recognize in each other and give each other permission to speak into it, but just recognize the dulling or the compromise or the attitudes or the things that we say that, you know, if we heard someone else saying it, we would bring it up. And, and ask, you know, saying to our friends, people in our life groups, people in our teams, hey, I give you permission to say to me, where, where have you gone? Where's your mojo? Where's, your, where's that hot leader <laughs> that I, I know and love? Because I, I haven't seen him or her for a while. Exactly. And that helps, right? Because when you're in it, you can't see it. So sure. somet- sometimes having somebody who you love and trust uh, to have that that moment with you where they're saying, "Hey, you know, you're not you're not burning. You're not burning hot right now. Um, is there anything I can support you in? Is there anything I can pray with you about? I think we're we're a gift to each other. The Bible says that iron sharpens iron um, in terms of our relationships with our brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are we are that God doesn't just come and do sovereignly something um, outside of his, outside of the church, outside of the people that he places around us. Yeah. So look around. Those people, they're gifts to you and tools to 
um, sharpen your axe and get hot for the Lord. Absolutely. So what we're saying is then with the, that you get an opportunity almost straight away with that because, as you know, with this podcast, it's not designed to be just listened to on your own. Uh, and that's it. But um, really, we believe this comes alive in conversation with other leaders. And so off the back of listening to this, there will be, there should be in your diary already a leadership life group where you can discuss this. Even if you don't agree with some of the stuff on the podcast, we're kind of like doing this to generate conversation and, and all conversation in, in this context, all conversation is good because we're talking, we're sharpening, we're considering other things. So make sure that you don't just do half of this exercise by listening to this. Commit to the 100% of this project by saying, I will go to this leadership life group, I will discuss the questions, and I will tell the truth, and I will be vulnerable, and all that stuff that we know comes from being together. Absolutely. Um when we're talking about being hot for God, we often share stories, war stories in a way, of the things that we used to do when we were younger and we were um, pursuing God and his plans and purposes uh, with fire and with um, determination. Um, oh, maybe there's an opportunity for you to discuss who has inspired you in the past and thought, yeah, I want to be like them. I want to serve God like these people. And then make a commitment together to say, well, it's our turn now. Yeah. Those stories that we talk about, they were great for then, but we've got to create new stories of what we did for the Lord and how awesome it was because everybody was together uh, making it happen. In the email that you received this link in are the questions. So you already know them. You know what you're going to be discussing. Um, we're looking forward to hearing all the great stories of what God is doing in and through you as an incredible, audacious leader. See you next time. See you guys. See you guys.